Hi, I'm Chef Gail Sokol and welcome to my kitchen. Today we're making Rubens for a crowd. Now you know what Rubens are, right? That's that really cool sandwich that some of the ingredients really don't go together, but it sort of just works. It's delicious. So it's traditionally rye bread. All right, so you get a slice of rye bread, you smear it with Russian dressing, and you layer corned beef, Swiss cheese, and sauerkraut. Isn't that wild? Put the top of the bread on top, second piece on top, and then grill it. And it's spectacular with the gooey Swiss cheese, with the corned beef, and the, the little saltiness of the sauerkraut. Yum, yum, yum. But I don't want to make individual sandwiches. No way. I want to make it for a crowd, and I want to make it in a braided loaf. And you can have it for your entire family. You can have it for any type of celebration, and it's super easy to do. It's a yeast bread, but it's delicious. So let's get started. And it really doesn't take that much time because it only has one rising. So in this bowl, I have four and a half cups of bread flour, and I'm going to have extra later in case I need more for my dough. You should always have extra water and extra flour nearby. You may or may not need it. It depends on how wet it is or humid it is in your kitchen, how much water or flour you add, and if you're packing your flour when you're measuring. Even weighing, you can pack a little bit. It just happens. So always be ready for that contingency. So I have my bread flour, one cup of rye flour, I'm gonna put right in there, all right? And then I'm gonna put my one and three quarter teaspoons instant active, that's that fast rising Arnold Schwarzenegger yeast that's actually going to be able to get be distributed right into our dry ingredients. And it will give you that extra oomph of power like only Arnold does, right? I wonder if he knows about me. I wonder if he knows that I talk about him all the time <laughs> because I love the power that he that he uh, creates. All right, so I'm whisking this up. You wanna get your flour, your yeast, everything whisked up. If you notice, I don't have my salt in here yet. Not yet, but I have it on the side. So right here, I have kosher salt, two and a quarter teaspoons, and I'm leaving it on the side. I'm not gonna add it just yet. Uh, you'll see, it, it'll make it a lot easier to knead and distribute the yeast and create great gluten if we let it go in a little bit later. So I'm gonna put my whisk over there, get a spoon ready. In my electric mixer, I'm gonna put in two and a quarter cups of warm water. It's, two, it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit, two and a quarter cups. I'm gonna have a little bit on the side, just in case, and two tablespoons of olive oil. I'm gonna add it right in there. For this type of bread, I like to add my wet ingredients first because I think they blend in better. And I'm gonna use my paddle in the beginning and then we're gonna to switch to the hook. All right, so I'm going to add my paddle now and I'm going to slowly add my dry ingredients. All right, so we have our flour and it doesn't have to be added slowly. It just spoon it in and just make sure you don't get a powderful in the face. Sometimes that happens, it can backlash, depending on the type of mixer. And don't go too fast, uh, too quickly. We'll, we'll get there, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll speed it up in a little while. So I start with my paddle, why do I do that? Because I think that it blends the dry and the wet ingredients a little bit better than just adding the hook. We're gonna to switch to the hook in a little while, and if you want to avoid the paddle and just go straight to the hook, you can, but stop your machine frequently and take that dough off the hook so that you make sure you get all your wet and dry ingredients evenly blended. All right, so we're getting a little bit thicker here. All right, and I'm going to switch to my hook in a minute to simulate the kneading process. And some people don't like to knead. I used to have students that didn't want to put their hands in the dough. Why don't you want to put your hands in the dough? Your hands are your best, best tools. And you do want to make sure that these tools can actually decipher 
whether or not your dough is getting thick enough and beautiful and elastic enough. All right, so all my dry ingredients are in there. And yes, my pat, my, uh, you can see it's getting all stuffed in there. I'm taking my hands and I'm going to get this paddle out. All right. Temporarily, I want you to see this. Okay. It's ooey and gooey. And that happens. This is bread baking. This is what happens. You make a mess. You clean it up. But it's so much fun. So rye flour on its own does not make high, high quality gluten. And we want gluten, remember, because it helps our bread rise. It helps get those stretchy protein matrix that actually traps that carbon dioxide that is going to form from our beautiful, our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful yeast. So I saved about a half a cup of bread flour and I do need it. So I'm going to add it, get it, knead it. I'm going to, I'm going to add it and I'm going to put my, my dough hook on. All right. And I'm going to let it go for a little bit. And if it's not where I want it to be, I'm going to bring it to the board. I'm going to let that go for a little while. Whoop, shooting at it over here. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. And you want to get that so that the flour is evenly distributed. Before we add our salt, we're going to give what's known as an auto lease. All right. And that's a German word that German bakers use, and everybody really uses that, depending on the type of bread, to give your bread a little rest. This gives the flour time to be absorbed by the water, because that's what forms gluten. When wheat flour mixes with water, and you don't get gluten-forming proteins until that happens. So I see that I have actually mixed this together nicely, and you can see that it's Still a little gooey. We might have to add a little more flour, and that's okay. I'm not going to worry about it. I can smell the rye. It smells good. But right now, it's still ooey and gooey because I haven't added my salt. Salt is the key. Salt actually helps create elasticity for our dough. And once we get this, flour has absorbed the water. High-quality gluten is going to form. We're going to give this a 10-minute, what I call, auto-lease, a little nap. A little rest. So I cover it with a clean kitchen towel. Take a little rest. And I'm going to give it 10 minutes. So we gave our dough, which is slightly wet, an auto lease, about 10 minutes rest. I'm taking its little blankie off and I'm going to add some salt. So you're going to go on medium speed with your dough hook, add your yeast all at once. Let it incorporate, and you're going to see it's going to get a little more elastic. It still may be wet, and that's why I have a little extra bread flour that I'm going to use. We're going to take my bowl scraper, and I'm going to scrape this beautiful dough out. We're going to knead it for a few minutes. All right. Oh, yeah, it really came together beautifully. It really is, and it should be a little soft. Like I said, rye on its own makes a beautiful bread, but it does always have to be added to a flour and used in a combination with a flour with very high quality proteins in it, like a wheat flour. All right, so let me get my, my bowl scraper, I get my dough. Look how pretty that is, it's beautiful. And it just has the right amount of rye in it. I'm going to get that out. All right. I'm going to get all of it out there. And then what I like to do is take your bench scraper. If it's still a little sticky, it shouldn't stick to your hands. But if it is, you're going to sort of fold it over on itself. This actually helps develop the gluten. If it's still a little tiny bit sticky, I don't really feel like I want to add flour. Try to not add flour if you can help it. So if it feels like this, and you can see it sort of feels like, sort of like a, sort of like a soft, not a bun of steel, 
your butt cheek, the muscle on the top of your butt, that's what it should feel like. Take a little oil, because I don't want to use flour, that's my other alternative, and sort of flip it around so it won't stick and start kneading it. All right. Yes, Chef Gail thinks that a beautiful dough feels like a butt cheek. It, it, it just does. I can't help it. Oh, this is lovely. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is a beautiful dough. Now, this is also developing the gluten. All right, and take a little bit, just a little bit of oil in your fingers. That way you're avoiding the dryness that you don't want to get when you make a yeast dough. So always try to avoid adding extra flour. I mean, if it looks like soup, add flour. But this is lovely. And I'm not insinuating anyone's butt cheek looks like this, but this is a good thing. This is lovely. See how smooth and elastic that is? And what you're seeing are those beautiful little pieces of rye in there. So I have a bowl. I have it all sprayed with Nonsa cooking spray. I'm going to take my beautiful dough. I'm going to put it in the bowl, and I'm going to flip it over so the grease side is up. I'm going to cover it with a piece of plastic wrap. And I'm going to put it in a nice warm spot for an hour till it doubles in size. So my Reuben dough has risen for an hour and it doubled. Baby, it probably doubled and a half. So it almost quadrupled. It was really high. So what I did was I poured it on the back of a 12 by 18 inch sheet pan. Don't be worried about the dimensions, just a large sheet pan, flip it over upside down, spray it with nonstick cooking spray or spread a little oil on it. Sort of dump your dough on it. Dumping is a, not a nice word, you know, gently dump it. And then push it out. So it's about a 10 by 15 inch rectangle. And if it's a little bit bigger, that's fine. It may shrink a little. And it's lovely, it's gorgeous. And then I'm going to take you could take whatever accoutrement you want, scissors, uh, pizza wheel. You could even just do a little knife. And I'm going to cut some sort of like, uh, like a scarf has fringe, like fringe on one side and then on the other side. I'm going to put our filling down the center. But before I do the fringe, I'm going to actually set some boundaries. So about three inches from each side, all right, I'm going to do, just make a little mark all the way down, three inches in, because this is going to be where our filling is going to be, all right? And the first thing we want to do is make our Russian dressing. So here I have a third of a cup of mayonnaise. Uh, you can use whatever type of mayonnaise you want. It could be, you know, anything you want. I have a third of a cup. I like chili sauce. If you like ketchup, use ketchup. If you have a store-bought version of Russian dressing, use that as well um, instead. And then I have a tablespoon of uh, pickle relish. And I'm just going to mix that in. I like the little bit of spice from the, and the heat from the chili sauce. It's not too much. Even kids would like it. So I'm going to mix that up, just like your typical Russian dressing. If you don't like pickle relish, leave it out. If you have any other accoutrement that you like, use that. And we're just going to put this down our center to guide us. And then we're going to spread it. All right. And if you want a little more, you can make a little more. You don't want to overstuff it because we're going to make like a mock braid. And it's so pretty. It's so pretty. So if you brought this out and let people see this, when you presented it, it looks really nice. Looks really nice. And you can't find this anywhere. You have to make this yourself, and it's amazing. So I'm just going to spread with an offset spatula all around. And I'm going to leave maybe, I probably should have left a little bit more, but like a quarter of an inch to half an inch from the top and the bottom, just so it doesn't ooze in the oven when it bakes. All right. I get carried away with my Russian dressing because I just want to spread it everywhere. It's so good. All right. 
And as you can see, I have my beautiful corned beef and I have my sliced Swiss cheese. You can get any type of corned beef you like, any type of Swiss cheese. It could be thick or thin, whatever you like. And I am going to start putting it down the center. Now I have about, I think it's about half a pound of corned beef. You can use a little more, a little less, whatever, but sort of layer it nicely. Oh, I'm getting a whiff of the corned beef. It's so, oh my goodness, this is going to be so good. It smells so good. And you want to layer this nicely because when you cut it, you can see those layers. Oh, it's so good. I may use the whole thing. I may just use the whole thing. Remember, you have other things to go on top. And then we're going to be braiding and making like this mock braid with the, with the fringe. All right, so I'm just going to, maybe I won't use the whole thing. We'll see. Moderation, right, Chef Gail? No, we don't like moderation. Let's put it down. I think this is it. This is it. This is it. Yep, this is it. All right, and now Swiss cheese. I don't like it too thin for this. I like it, eh, it's about an eighth of an inch. It's not super, super thin, so you're just going to put sort of shingle it, shingle it, shingle it. Oh, so good. This is about four, this, you know, I, I'm, my directions say about four ounces of Swiss cheese. It's a loose, it's a loose, it's a suggestion. If you want a little more, use a little more. I'm probably using a little bit more. All right. This is good. This is good. And now my sauerkraut. So I have about eight ounces of sauerkraut. I have squeezed the dickens out of it because you don't want any wetness, you know, any water-based wetness to make our uh, Reuben braid mushy. So I have literally, look how nice and dry that looks, okay? And we're gonna split, put that on top. Just sort of scatter, just sort of scatter. It goes everywhere, that's okay. It's all going to be in the sandwich. Mmm, smells so good. Yum, yum, yum. Now, I don't know if you like uh, caraway seeds. I did not put them in the dough. If you do want to put them in the dough, put them in. If you don't want to put them in the dough, you can even put them on top. All right. And I think that's what I'm going to do. So we're going to egg wash it before with a little egg white. Okay, now this is the fun part. This is when I like to fringe. All right, so I'm just going to take maybe uh, every inch. You can do as many as you want. Just start taking your, I'm going to use my pizza wheel and just making strips about an inch wide and only go up to where the, the Russian dressing starts and your filling start and just go all the way around. All right. If you can't see what I'm gonna, what I'm doing, I'm gonna turn it around so you can see. All right, so about an inch. The length of one of your knuckles is about an inch, so you can sort of guide like that. If you want a few more, you can do more. It's up to you. And if you want to use scissors, you can use scissors. Make sure they're sharp and make sure they're meant for a kitchen. You don't want to take like, you know, your kid's scissors from school. That would not be good. That would not be good. All right. Now I'm going to do the same on the other side. So it's very fringy. And you're going to try to match the fringe from one side to the other. So you can see that you made one side equal with the other. So you have the same, approximately the same number of fringe. If it's not, don't worry. It'll all uh, balance out in the end. Don't worry. OK. I'm going fringe happy here. And you're going to stretch the dough and you're going to make this mock braid that is going to knock your friends and family's socks off. They're going to love it. All right, you ready? All right, I'm going to move this over so you can see it. The first one, I'm going to take the little bit of the dough on the top and flip it up because I don't want any mishaps in my oven. I don't want to have to clean my oven afterwards and have this beautiful Russian dressing all over the bottom of my oven. And so at, keep that little flap in 
and then just braid. So it goes right, left, right, left, right, left, right? So here we go. And you can see it, see, you're building this beautiful braid. You see it, you see it, you see it, it's gorgeous. It's so pretty. And it's sort of not a real braid, but who cares? It's beautiful and you have little holes in it. So steam can escape and it's just lovely. It reminds me of the pharaohs in Egypt, doesn't it? <laughs> it just does. But who would not want a sarcophagus like this filled with this yummy filling? Yum, yum, yum. And this is why I call it my Reuben braid. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn it over so you can see how I'm going to end this because you have to do the same thing that you did uh, before. So you want to flip this over. All right, I'm going to flip it over. But I'm going to flip it over before I do this one because I want to make sure all that filling stays in. And if this sort of over, okay, because I really want that to stay in and just sort of tuck, tuck and just give it a little, you know, a little tuck, a little press, a little press. It's gorgeous, gorgeous. Now, egg white. So we're going to take a little egg white with a pastry brush. All right. And we're going to just egg wash. And you do not have to let this rise again. I have found the times that I did this, because I did this for my textbook about professional baking, and I have made some modifications since, uh, just because, you know, tastes change and you want to do things a little different, update them. I, I really find that when I let it rise too much, it got huge. So there's no reason to let it rise again. You're going to bake it off right now. 375 degrees is what my oven is preheated to. And now I'm going to take some caraway seeds. They smell good. If you don't like caraway seeds, leave them off. But it really is traditional for a rye bread. We can get it with seeds and without seeds. And this is going to bake. It's going to get nice and brown. And you're going to see some, you know, bubbling through the holes. Not as much as you would with a pie, but it is going to take, I mean, make sure I get this right, about 35 to 40 minutes, because this is my recipe that I've actually been honing for a number of years. This is my best kept secret, my Reuben braid. Great for dinner, great for a picnic, great for, you know, even an appetizer if you want to go real light and do like a wine and cheese and then bring this out. Oh, it's lovely. So I'm going to bake this off between 35 and 40 minutes. You want to make sure it's firm. You want to make sure the bread looks nice and brown. And I'll see you back. Look at this gorgeous Reuben braid. It's lovely. It's hot. The cheese is bubbly. And you can see the Russian dressing peeking out. And let it cool down just a little bit. It can be served at warm room temperature. I would, you can serve it hot too. It is gorgeous. You can serve this to all your family and friends. I hope you make this Reuben braid. I hope you love it. I hope you become a subscriber. Till next time.